We've looked at audit risk and financial statement risk, and that has involved us having a brief look also at business risk. Now, potentially, there is another type of business risk question that we might get. It's not really anything to do with audit planning. This is the question that says, identify and explain a company's business risks, and then says, what would you advise the company to do to manage those business risks? So forget about the financial statements and being an auditor and turn yourself instead into a risk advisor. This is part of the non-audit bit of the course, the other assurance services. So it's very relevant and since we are looking at risk, it seems like a sensible point to take a look at this issue as well. So let's consider how companies look at business risk and what an exam question might look like. When companies manage risk, there are quite a few stages they have to go through. As far as this exam is concerned, our main issues are going to be these stages. So, we might be required in a question to actually identify business risks. However, there have also been some questions where the risks have been listed out for us, and then we've had to deal with them. So I suspect the more important stages are the second two up there. Assessing and prioritising involves measuring the risk to try to decide which ones are most important, and therefore which ones a company should try to manage first. The variables involved here are likely to be what is the potential impact of the risk, which we might try to measure in financial terms, and secondly, what is the likelihood of that risk. And maybe that's a percentage chance, a probability. There might also be a third variable, because there may well be a risk which is high impact, and maybe it's highly likely to happen, but if it's many years in the future, maybe we don't need to try to manage it today, or in fact, maybe we're not able to manage it today. And you may, in the exam, have to actually assess some risks against those sort of criteria to decide how important they are. The final stage, at least for this exam, is to suggest how those risks could be managed. And you may have seen on another exam paper a rather useful little mnemonic which will help us to remember four basic ways of dealing with risk. Four basic ways of dealing with risk. Transfer that risk onto somebody else. And the most common way of doing that is to pay for some insurance. Obviously that comes at a cost, but then all risk management comes at some sort of cost. In some cases, it may be best just to avoid the risk completely, if that's possible. Reducing the risk is the one that we as auditors probably understand the best, as one common way of doing this is using internal controls. However, another potential way that businesses could reduce risk 
in a more general sense, is to diversify, spread their operations among lots of different industries so that if one particular part of the business is suffering, there's a reasonable chance that another bit of the business is doing fairly well. And the final way is not to manage the risk, if you like, to accept it. And don't forget, you have to take risk normally to get some sort of return. So if we decide not to accept any risk, we're not likely to get any sort of return. And the other reason for accepting some risks is that in some cases, there isn't really that much we can do about it. Sometimes you've just got to get on with it. So four basic ways of managing risk. What we're going to do now is take a look at a past exam question with business risk in it. It will also refer us back to something we did in audit strategy just before we started doing audit planning. And we'll see how we get on with this. The question we're going to look at is called Ferry. It's from the June 2003 exam paper. So obviously that is not P7 because P7 only came in at the end of 2007. But it's from the corresponding exam paper under the old syllabus, which was pretty much the same syllabus we have now. OK, so here we go with Ferry. As always, the first thing we're going to do is take a look at what the actual requirements of the question say, and then we can start worrying about the story. As we can see, it's a three-part question. The first bit says, describe what is meant by the term top-down approach in the context of business risk audit methodology. Well, as you may well remember from audit strategy, the top-down approach is that method where we look at business risks and then use those to determine why the accounts might be wrong, the financial statement risks. So for five marks, we need to put a little plan together. And the way to look at it is, for five marks, we're probably looking to make around about five comments. So we need to think about the keywords we'd need to answer that. And we'll come back to that in a second or two. Parts B and C are clearly linked together. Part B wants us to identify and explain the business risks. And part C describe the processes to manage those business risks. Ten marks for each. C is clearly linked to B. And so when I answer B and C, I'll probably answer them together in two columns next to each other. Notice in part B it says identify and explain. There is a big danger with business risk that we simply copy things out of the question without actually saying why they're risks. But first, let's have a look at part A. For this part of the question, I'm just going to look at an answer plan rather than writing it out in full. Let's just make sure we know what we'd want to talk about. Well, when we looked at this, we said that the top-down approach was an attempt to maybe modernise the audit risk approach by focusing on particular elements. We would still carry out the audit risk method and look at inherent control, etc. But we're now going to focus on particular issues. The top-down approach is where we look at business risks in order to generate our understanding of why the accounts might be wrong. And the key elements of top-down are When we're looking at internal controls of a client, the top-down approach says focus on environment rather than procedures.
and for substantive testing we're going to focus on analytical procedures. Now, both control environment, which is all about understanding the company's management, culture, staff, and analytical procedures, which requires understanding of the links between all the numbers in the accounts, understanding trends of the company, and stuff like that, both of those require a strong understanding of the client's business. That in itself is going to require us to spend more time at the planning stage and also to involve people who are good at understanding businesses, which means more time on the audit for the more senior members of the audit team, like partners and managers. This in turn leads to two great benefits. Partners and managers are more likely to be able to spot the really big issues that shareholders care about, like the existence of potentially fraud and also the existence of going concern problems. And it also means that with more partners and managers involved and having a better understanding of the client, our ability to add value during the audit should also be increased. So that's the top-down approach a focus on understanding our client's business and letting that drive our understanding of the key issues for the accounts. Any explanation that tries to use those sort of points is likely to score fairly highly. But now let's move on to the big chunk of the question, the 20 marks involved in B plus C. Part B, let's spot some business risks. Part C, what should Ferry try to do about them? With 10 marks each for B and C, presumably it's one mark for the risk and one mark for trying to deal with it. So we're looking for about 10 issues. Let's have a look through the ferry story and see what we can find. OK. The first paragraph just tells us that we are bringing the top-down approach into our audit work, and we've dealt with that in Part A. It's the story that we need to look at. Don't forget that this question came up in June 2003, so bear that in mind when we look at the dates. When you're doing this question, you're going to need to remember that you are currently sitting this exam in June 2003. So let's take a look. In July 1999, so that will be four years ago then, Ferry purchased exclusive rights to operate a car and passenger ferry route until December 2008. So it's got about five and a half years left. OK, well, the question is about business risks, so what could go wrong with this? Well, it seems there are two obvious things that could go wrong. You have purchased exclusive rights. Presumably, there are terms and conditions applied to that, and if you breach them, you might have these rights taken back. The second issue is maybe we don't do anything to breach the terms and conditions, but maybe in December 2008 we don't get the rights renewed. So two main issues. We lose the rights due to poor performance, or we simply don't get them renewed, which could also be due to poor performance.
How do we go about managing those two issues? Well, presumably, if we don't want to lose the rights, we need to abide by the terms and conditions. So someone in the company needs to make a note of all the terms and conditions, monitor our performance against them, so that we can flag up any problems and deal with them quickly. As far as the rights not being renewed when they run out in December 2008, well, if someone is monitoring performance, that should help us to perform well and therefore hopefully get another deal. But with December 2008 five and a half years away, we might be tempted in June 2003 to simply say, let's do nothing about this yet. Probably what you'd want to do is schedule some meetings with whoever you purchase these rights from maybe in 2006, 2007, and start talking about contract renewals. So there we go. Let's go back to the story and see what else we can find. This offers an alternative to driving an additional 150 kilometres via the nearest bridge. Well, you can see why having these rights is such an advantage. If they don't cross on your ferry, passengers would have a very long trip to get across this water. There have been several ambitious plans to build another crossing but they failed through lack of public support and government funds. So what could go wrong here? There is public support, and the government funds are made available, and there's another bridge. Is there much we can do about this? Well, to a certain extent, if the ferry service is efficient, good quality, and customers are happy, the chances are public support for a bridge will be minimal, and therefore the government won't act. So to a great extent, good performance might solve this problem. But bear in mind one other thing. If someone decides they're building a bridge, there's probably not much we can do about it to stop them. But bridges do not get built in three weeks. The chances are, by the time there's enough public support, the government have agreed to do it, the plans are drawn up and the bridge is built, it's probably after 2008 anyway. So our deal may have run out. All we need to do for this question is keep going through the story and for everything we're told, ask ourselves, but what could go wrong with that? What do we need to plan for to manage that risk? Ferry refurbished two 20-year-old roll-on, roll-off boats to service the route. The boats do not yet meet the emission standards of environmental protection regulations which come into force in 2004. That's next year, don't forget, because we're in 2003. Well, presumably the danger of having 20-year-old boats, even if you've refurbished them, is they're more likely to go wrong, have maintenance problems, and not be able to sail. Or maybe worse still, 
have accidents. The fact that they don't meet these regulations presumably means that if we don't do something soon, these boats are unusable when those regulations come in. Of course, these days, if the boats are environmentally unfriendly, that will also put people off travelling on them and also damage the company's reputation. So what should the company do about this? Well, various possibilities. If you're concerned about the fact your boats are old, it might be worth considering buying or maybe leasing some newer boats. Alternatively, we should have a regular maintenance plan. Now, we're about to read in the story that there are a couple of boats and they are constantly working 365 days a year. So, presumably, a regular maintenance plan needs to take one boat out of service at a time, so you've always got one boat working, needs to be timed for when passenger numbers are fairly low, but this environmental regulation stuff needs to be done immediately. So there are a few thoughts for that one. Now, what I'm hoping that you're spotting here is that this doesn't appear to be too difficult to question. All you have to do is question everything you're told and what damage it could do to the business. And as far as managing the risks, much of what's up here is not that clever. It's just using a bit of business common sense. Let's go back to the story and see what else we can find. Each boat makes three return crossings every day of the year, subject to weather conditions. Well, there's a risk. The risk to the company is bad weather. So what do companies do to manage the risk of bad weather? Because unless you know some magic that I don't, you can't change the weather but you can predict it in advance. Surely it would be a good idea for this ferry company to make sure that they have access to the latest weather forecasts so that they can plan ahead. And if they know in advance that passengers won't be able to travel, maybe put out warnings through radio stations and TV that the boats won't be working, and maybe they need to have on each side of this journey some sort of terminal building where passengers can wait in comfort, maybe with cafe, a couple of shops, TV screens, just to make them comfortable. Because if they know that when they turn up and can't travel, there's nowhere to sit, there's nothing to do, the danger is they get back in the car and drive to that bridge.
Now, there are actually other things you can do as well. Some companies will get weather insurance. If they know they have a service or goods which are very much affected by the weather conditions, you can insure against it, so in bad weather you get some compensation. OK, time to go back to the question again. Each boat has the capacity to carry approximately 250 passengers and 40 vehicles. So what? The ferry service carried just 70,000 vehicles in the year to the 31st of December 2002. Now, we can see that those numbers are gradually getting higher, which is good. But should we be concerned that they carried 70,000? Well, based on two ferries doing three return journeys every day, that's two times three is six journeys per ferry. There are two ferries, makes 12. So that's 12 trips a day. And if each of those 12 trips can carry 40 vehicles, and if there are 365 days in the year, well, my mental arithmetic tells me that's something like 175,000 or so vehicles that could have been carried if they were 100% full. Well, 70,000 is less than half of 175,000. So on average, these boats are less than half full. Now, that doesn't sound desperately efficient to me. Running ferries is a fairly high fixed cost business and you don't want the ferry to travel if there aren't too many people on it. Less than 50% capacity suggests to me that they might be loss making. In other words, they haven't hit break even point yet. So it's critical that they get those numbers up. How can we get those vehicle numbers to be higher? Well, presumably, we need to do some advertising, maybe doing some special deals so that when the numbers are particularly low, off-peak periods, odd times of the day, maybe some sort of discount can be applied. OK, back we go again. Hot and cold refreshments and travel booking facilities are offered on the one-hour crossing. These services are provided by independent businesses on a franchise basis. So what could go wrong with that? Well, presumably, what could go wrong is that these independent businesses who offer these services on your boats either offer a bad quality service or maybe their staff don't turn up. And who's going to get the blame for that? Probably ferry, because they're your boats. So we need to make sure that the quality of these franchises is good enough. And the best way to monitor quality? Test it. Maybe use some fake customers to see what sort of service they get. And also, of course, you can ask the passengers on the ferry how good the customer service was from these facilities.
Again, what we seem to be suggesting here is just business common sense. There's no great skill to it, apart from the ability to think a little bit. Of course, the problem is, in an exam, when you're under pressure, being able to free think like this is not the easiest thing in the world. Ferry currently receives a subsidy from the local transport authority as an incentive to increase market awareness of the service and its efficient and timely operation. The subsidy increases as the number of vehicles carried increases and is based on quarterly returns submitted to the authority. What can go wrong with this? Well, of course, we might not get much of a subsidy if we're not carrying many vehicles, but we've addressed the low number of vehicles already. The new concern I'm having is, what if we don't submit those quarterly returns on time and don't get the subsidy? Or what if they've got mistakes in them? If it's discovered that our returns are wrong, maybe we'll get penalty, or maybe we won't receive the subsidy anymore. How do we make sure that those returns are right? and that they're submitted on time. Well, one way to do that is to get someone to audit that process. Now, just before we carry on with this, let's see how we're getting on. We needed 10 business risks. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like we're at eight, which is not too bad because we've still got some stuff to look at. But before we go back to the story, is there something else that could go wrong for a ferry company that we've not yet come across? Because there's one big risk for any transportation company, and in this particular question, it's not mentioned in the story at all, but it's still a risk, and that is fuel prices. Because these ferries don't move by magic, they need fuel. And fuel prices can vary tremendously, as we've experienced recently. What can Ferry do to deal with this risk? Well, the most obvious answer is probably hedging. Use forward contracts. Use options, futures, or something along those lines. We go to the question. Ferry employs 20 full-time crew members who are trained in daily operations, customer service and passenger safety. What could go wrong there? Well, if you've got 20 full-time trained staff, surely the main danger is that the staff don't turn up for work because they're sick, or they go on strike, or maybe they just leave, which is going to increase your training costs as you have to train new people. Potential solutions to this? Well, I suppose we could have a deal with an agency who specialise in properly trained staff so we can fill gaps when we need to. Uh, maybe instead of having 20 full-time staff, we should try to increase our staff numbers and have more part-time staff so that there are always some people not working who could be called on in a crisis.
Well, we're almost there, but we've already got our 10 risks. So this has gone fairly well, I think. But let's just look at the last point just to complete it. The management of Ferry is planning to apply for a recognised safety management certificate in 2004. This will require a ship audit, including the review of safety documents and evidence that activities are performed in accordance with documented procedures. The SMC, valid for five years, will be issued if there are major, or sorry, if there are no major non-conformities found. Well, this would sound like a really useful thing to have. The danger, of course, is we apply for it and fail. So if we're going to apply for this certificate, we want to make sure we pass it. So wouldn't it be a good idea to get an outside expert in to point out all the current problems, try to rectify them, make sure staff are aware of the importance of this, and then apply for it when you know you're in with a fairly good chance of actually getting it. So there we go. Question completed. If this were the real exam, I would need to write some of these points in a bit more detail as I've not really gone for very long sentences and explanations. But actually identifying the points in a business risk question doesn't seem to be too challenging. No debits and credits to worry about, nothing technical. This is largely common sense. So we've taken a look at various types of risk. Let's just summarise them as they're very important and you will virtually always see risk on this exam. Audit risk questions, inherent control detection, but most of the answer likely to be inherent. Remember the key technique from this? Down the side of the page, IR, CR, DR, go through the story, very quickly plan your answer, and then start writing it. And don't forget, if a question says, do some audit work on a particular area of the accounts, that surely means it's a risk. So that's audit risk. Financial statement risk is pretty much the same thing. So all you have to do, same approach as audit risk, same tips, same technique, but just ignore detection risk. And then finally, we looked at business risk. So there we go. You can be asked several different types of risk uh, on the exam. Just make sure when you read the question, you note what type of risk it is 
and just stop for a few seconds and focus your mind before you go any further.